Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you again this morning, so that we can unite our hearts and voices to worship our God, the Father. Let us remember His grace and His mercy that we see morning by morning. Let us remember His faithfulness, for He changes not, and His love. Abide forever.
You are joining Karawachi Presbyterian Church Online Worship. How we long to meet one another physically again as one body of Christ. But more than anything, we long to be united with Christ himself. Not just spiritually, but also physically. For the day will come when we shall behold him face to face and enjoy his presence as our Lord and King forever. So brothers and sisters, let us draw near to the throne of grace to worship him. Call for worship taken from Psalm 29, 9-11. In the Lord's temple, everything says, Glory. The, the Lord, Lord said as king at the flood. Yes. Yes. yes, the Lord sees as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Let us worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Our God is great God, and he is worthy to be praised and worship. Let us worship him and sing this hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Let us pray. O God, you are truly our great God, your greatness beyond what our minds can comprehend. When we consider the sun and the moon and the stars in the universe, who we are, that you mindful of us, who we are that you love us and give yourself to us. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Allow us this morning as we gather and unite our hearts and voices to you to enjoy your presence, Lord. As we lift up our voices to you to magnify your name, let our voices be heard to you, Lord. Even as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to worship and adore you. We praise you, God, the Father Almighty. We praise you, God, the true and only Son. We praise you, God, the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. By day and night, with voice and heart, praise and adoration shall be given to you. Father, we thank you for all your mercies and for your loving care over all your creatures. We bless you for the gift of life, for your protection all about us, for your guiding hand upon us. We thank you for the saving faith, for the living presence of your spirit, for the church, for the ministry of the word, for all the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. Make us wise in using all your blessings. Father, we seek your mercy that you will restore our souls in Jesus Christ, that we may be merciful and kind as you are. Let your forgiveness make us willing to forgive all wrongs which we have suffered and to ask forgiveness for every wrong which we have done. Let the same mind be in us, which also in you. Let our love and charity be abundant as our joy, that our hearts may be tender to all need, and our hand give freely for your sake. Forgive our laziness. Father, we pray that you will bless all ministers of the word who preach your holy word faithfully. We pray that all Christians will be in the bonds of holy faith, May your glory will arise and shine upon all lands through our life as your children. Father, we pray that purity, love, and honor may dwell in our homes and duty and affections be the bond of family life. Help us to train our children in the ways of reverence and truth and keep those absent from us under the shield of thy care. Father, we pray for the recovery of our situation today. Bless our rulers and our people with your wisdom. Heal those who are sick. Provide those who are in need. Strengthen those who are in difficulty. Move our heart to see and to help. And we pray this prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have an announcement from the elders about communion. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper or communion is one of two sacraments in the Presbyterian and Reformed churches along with baptism. Baptism is the initial, initiatory sign of being included among God's people. The Lord's Supper is the ongoing, repeated sign of being included among God's people. Both sacraments are means of grace, of spiritual growth for us as Christians. Although neither sacrament is automatic, but rather dependent for God's blessing on the faith in Jesus Christ of those participating in the sacrament. We believe in the real presence of Christ in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, not his physical presence, but his spiritual presence as we look to him in faith. The sacraments are sometimes called the, the word made visible, pictures 
of the gospel and of Christ and of his promises to us. The written word of God we hear preached and taught and applied every week, even when we do not celebrate the sacraments, the visible word. There is no clear mandate in the New Testament how often the sacrament of the Lord's Supper should be observed. Some Christian churches observe this sacrament weekly or monthly. Other Christian churches seek to observe this sacrament at least quarterly during the year, which has been our practice at KPC and at the Christ chapels. Whenever the sacrament is observed, it should be done so seriously and following biblical guidance, including the preaching of the Word of God, so that the participants fully understand the sacrament and have the opportunity to search their hearts in repentance and faith before they participate in the sacrament. Although some Christian churches during this COVID-19 pandemic have offered what they call virtual communion, where the participants are separated from each other, prepare their own communion elements, and then partake at the same time while they are online, the elders, the presbyters of KPC and the Christ chapels have decided not to offer this kind of virtual communion. The Lord's Supper was intended as a meal together in each other's presence and as a time of communion with Christ and with one another. We look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper together again in person as soon as we're able to gather in person again for worship. In the meantime, we continue to feed on Christ and nurture our faith in him through hearing the written word of God read and when it is faithfully preached and taught week after week. May the Lord continue to bless us all as we worship him. Good morning. We will continue our study from the book of Philippians. And this morning, we will study from Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Paul starts this chapter with a hymn's word, that is the word therefore. As we know together, the word therefore always works as consequences of the preceding text. And what Paul says in chapter 4, is kind of tips and tricks how to live rejoyful with what Paul said in chapter 1 and 3. In chapter 4, Paul said that stand firm in the Lord, to agree in the Lord, to help Christian fellows, to rejoice in the Lord, do not be anxious about anything, pray with thanksgiving, and to think whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, and commendable. But in our text today, we will just discuss three of them, that is to stand firm, to agree, and to help. So let's open our Bible from Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, 2, 3. And I will read for us. This is God's word. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Yodia, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. This is God's holy word for God's holy people, you and me. Let's pray. Father, we have read your Bible. We have listened to your text. And now we want to understand this text. 
Therefore, we pray that the Holy Spirit, the great author who inspired Paul, will also enlighten our heart and mind so we can know, we can understand, and this truth will transform our life. And we pray this prayer in your Son's name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Have you ever doubted something? Are you doubting what you are doing now? Questioning uh, the step that you are taking? It certainly makes us stressful and no joy. Life is beautiful, but we know together it's not always easy. We all know God is good, but sometimes when distress, hardship, afflictions, or even tribulations come, we start to question. Where is the grace? Where is the peace from God? Perhaps in your study or in your work, you find it tough and you start to doubt that you are on the right path or in your marriage, you're facing hardship and difficulty and you start to question, you start to doubt your marriage vow or in your business, you have tried all good things and right steps, but the result is not there. At this point, many people start to question, does God care? Does God hear my prayers? Is God in control? Does God exist? We may in different level of doubtful, but we all equally in doubt. So after all encouraging word in chapter one to three, Paul opened chapter four with the word therefore. Therefore, we have to know what Paul said in chapter 1 to 3 in brief. Paul is so joyful for their koinonia in the gospel, for their partnership in the gospel. Paul encouraged them to continue supporting the work of the gospel. Paul urged them to make progress in their faith. Paul explained what spiritual looks like. It does not come through special mythical insight, but rather through practicing of loving God, and loving our neighbors. Paul exhort them look not only to their own interests, but also to the interests of others. And Paul said, do all things without grumbling. Paul himself gave them an example from his life. From the human perspective, Paul is someone great, but he himself does not think so. He directs his eyes to the divine calling. For Paul, to know Christ and the power of his resurrections is worthier than being someone. And Paul closed the first three chapters with something cool. That is, Breton, imitating me. Wow, how many of us dare to say like Paul, imitating me. Why, why, why Paul says to imitate him? Is Paul perfect? No, he's not. In chapter 3, he said that he's not perfect. But what he did is he pressed on the divine calling of God. Paul wants them to direct their life of God's calling to God's calling by following him. Remember, Paul said in chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, that there are two groups of people in the church. One, those who are walking according to Christ. That is Paul and other gospel fellows. And the other is those who walk as enemies of Christ. So remember last week, Pastor Craig said that one is climbing up and the other is stepping down. One will end in destruction and others will end with a glorious body. Okay, Paul, we know all this thing. Uh, we know that all you have explained we learn it from our theological class. But Paul, come on. Life is not easy. We are facing hardship. How this thing, how knowing this thing will help us not to grumble? And this is what Paul says. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand from dust in the Lord, my beloved. We can see how Paul valued the relationship. Paul called them beloved that he longed 
4. Indeed, Paul wants to meet them again. Paul was in the jail, so he sent Timothy and Epaphroditus to show his love. And Paul called them his joy and crown. Paul in jail knows that all his labor will not be in vain. At the end, the church in Philippi will be his joy. When they become Christian and their fellowship in the gospel, Paul rejoice in what, what they do. In the New Testament, crown is used metaphorically as eternal reward of the faithful. For Paul, seeing the faithful Christian is joyful and rewarding. Do we have the same perspective with Paul when we see our faithful brother and sister in the church? To those whom he loved and longed for, Paul said, Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in the ways that Paul and other Christian fellows do. There are no perfect disciples, but what Paul said is to imitate him in straining forward to what lies ahead. In other words, to stand in the Lord is to keep our hearts, minds, and eyes to the call of God in Jesus Christ. You cannot stand on something if you disagree with that thing. Think about this. When we install an app in our handphone or in, in computer, we always meet a button of something like this. Check here or click here to indicate that you have read and agreed to the terms of service. If you want to use that software, there's no other way you must click it. But how many of you read the whole agreement, the whole terms and service before you click it? Do you know what they expect from you? Will you do whatever the software company requires? What happens is, if you don't like it, you just uninstall it. But not with the Lord. To stand in the Lord is not like clicking a button of I agree now and uninstall it later. When we repent and believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we totally to look to the Lord and unite with Him. We must click the button. But the more important is we must agree to what the Lord wants us to do. To stand firm in the Lord could be read as stand firm or stand in obedience to the Lord. And the phrase in the Lord shows us that the one who stands in Him must listen to the Lord and follow Him. Why? Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, For these reasons, brothers, in all our distress and afflictions, we have been comforted about, your, about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Whenever they got distress or affliction, Paul and other fellows depend on the standing, on this standing in the Lord. In this sense, we must imitate Paul. Continuing to stand in obedience to the Lord will provide comfort and power to our life, especially when we face many hardships. Paul advised us, whatever our circumstances are, Whenever you doubt, we must stand firm in obedience to the Lord. But not in the sense you will give all your power or your effort to stand firm like this. You will fail. The gospel tells us that Jesus' blood and righteousness is our solid rock. That we can stand firm. All other ground is sinking sand, including your efforts to stand firm. We need to hear this gospel again and again that is in Christ alone, in Christ alone. Stand firm in the Lord is to stand firm in Christ that is to keep loving God and our neighbor and also in the partnership of the gospel, whatever your situation is. When we were in the state, our first son, Jason, he was around fourth or fifth grade at the time. He loves burger a lot. He can eat burger more than other people can eat without being bored. So one day I asked him, Jason, 
Are you not bored eating burger like that? And this is what he answered me. Dad, I don't focus on eating the burger. I focus on enjoying the burger. It's fun. When we stand firm in the Lord, it could be challenging, boring, but don't focus on the standing itself. Focus on enjoying the Lord. It's fun. When you stand firm, focus your eyes to love God and to love our neighbor. And Paul gives us two examples how to love our neighbor in verse 2 and verse 3. Let's see, verse 2. Paul said, I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. We live in a messy world, full of messy relationship. The church is not sterile with, uh, of this problem. Even in a good and healthy church, dispute is there. So God made humans unique and also different. It's not easy for us uh, to always agree with each other. Often we disagree and this becomes a source of dispute. We do not know who these women are. Who is Yodia? Who is Sintike? The Bible didn't tell us their detailed information. But what we know from verse 2 and 3, they are Paul's fellow workers in the gospel. Paul said that they have labored side by side with him. It shows that they are a close team of, to Paul. What is debated, we also do not know. But in verse 2, Paul asked them to agree in the Lord. Paul did not say they have to agree in many things. They are two different people. God created them unique. But as Christian and as the gospel workers, at least they agree in the Lord. Paul and trade, or to be more precise, Paul begs them to agree in the Lord. Paul begs them individually. He begs Yodia. He begs Syntyche. Paul loves and concern about them. To agree in the Lord literally is to think the same thing in the Lord or to have the same attitude and values that Christ had. And Paul used this word 10 times in the book of Philippians and all is to express the sameness of mind in the Lord. In chapter 2 verse 2 Paul says, when we have the same mind and the same love, they complete the joy of him. Paul says, you might disagree in many things, but please remember your common bond in the Lord. Preacher Ken Hughes one time said like this, to live above the saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with the saints we know, well, that is another story. We love to gather together with all saints, but in new heaven and new earth, that will be glory. But now we are live on this earth with all saints who still live. That is another story. Why? Because at various points and various levels, we disagree each other. We disagree in some areas of Christian doctrine. We disagree to some details of church administrations. We disagree to the way with certain tasks of the church should be pursued. We disagree in politics. We disagree with people in our office. There's a friction between husband and wife, brothers and sister, parents and children. Which of you never disagree with other people? We might not be able to fight disagreement, to avoid disagreement. So many times when we disagree, the rule of thumb is like this. I am right and you are wrong. We never think and prepare to say that I am wrong and you are right. Of course, this does not apply to certain basic truths like salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and other basic truth. But many times, when we disagree with something, mostly it's not in fundamental things. And frequently, we are more interested to show people we are right than to discover the truth. We are unwilling to acknowledge our fallibility. 
One pastor said like this, We judge others by their action, but we judge ourselves by our intention. If our brother and sister commit something, some mistakes, we will say that that is a mistake. Of course that is. But we do not want to know or want to hear why it happened. But if that's happened to us, we will say, I'm sorry, that is not our intention. Matthew 7 verse 12, Jesus said like this, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. We owe people to love them. We owe people to be their brothers, to be their neighbor. And Paul says in chapter 2 verse 4, that to look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. And this quote from Charles Spurgeon, Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, but if you are drawn into controversy, use a very hard arguments and a very soft words. We have an obligation to love people. Yes, we also have an obligation to the truth. If someone not in the truth, we do not need to agree with them. But we owe people to love them. My professor John Frames says like this, many times when people are dispute of something, they agree on substance, but they use different words. Or at other time, they use the same word, but different in meaning. Being winsome, that is what we proclaim through our church at KPC and Christ Chapel. We want to be a winsome reform. Being winsome means that we know that we are not infallible. Thus, we need to be respectful to others to discover the truth beyond our selfishness. So let's continue to verse 3. Paul did not tell us what the problem is. It seems the dispute was not moral or heresy because Paul will ask them to repent. But instead, Paul asking a third party to help them. This is what Paul says in verse 3. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Paul called his true companion in the church of Philippi to help, to be the mediator. Paul called Clement and other fellow workers. It clears, it clears Paul warned Christian in the church to help those who are in this agreement. And this is in accordance with Jesus' teaching in May 18 that we can bring and help other fellow in the church to solve their problem. Church, as a body of Christ, not to be uh, curious in everything, or Indonesian said kepo, and kepo also stands for uh, knowing every particular object. No, we, we are not calling to that. But we are called to help our members, our brother and sister, if they are in dispute. Frankly speaking, many Christians today, instead of being a mediator, often they become provocators. Or in Bahasa Indonesia, they call being kompor and make the situation even worse. Paul calls the church, help Eurokia. Church, help Sintike. And Paul said they are true Christians who work together with Paul for spreading the gospel. Paul even was so sure that their names are in the book of life. Paul wants Christian, as the body of Christ, to be in koinonia, to be in partnership in the gospel, and also helping other fellows. As a church, we are responsible for one another. Paul says that we are members of one another. So when a conflict arises that threatens the health of the church, 
or commands people in the church as a true companion to get involved. Paul reminded them that their citizenship is in heaven. And now he stressed it again that their name is written in the book of life. What's Paul's point here? The true gospel, Paul said, the true gospel unites believers not only on earth. Yes, we work together for the gospel, but the gospel also unites us in heaven when we all will be in koinonia or fellowship with Jesus and with other fellow forever. The community of the redeemed in heaven will owe this solely to the sacrifice of Jesus. Nothing come from our efforts. We will share in the divine life in perfect fellowship with God. In other words, Paul said, remember what we have in common. The blood of Jesus. Jesus' righteousness. The calling to spread the gospel. Our beautiful fellowship, both here and in the heaven. And our welcoming party in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember, Jesus might sit us on the same table. Paul cannot imagine that people who are united with the Lord both now and in heaven fight each other. For this reason, Paul urges, Paul begs them to agree in the Lord. As a unique human being, we, we might disagree with many things. But always remember that we are in the fellowship with the Lord. Paul reminds them to see everything not only from the now perspective, but also from the eternal perspective. In the light of eternity, partnership in the gospel, fellowship as a Christian is more significant than many of our disagreement, misunderstanding, or our bitterness. So my brother and sister, when this beautiful life becomes not easy, when you doubt about the goodness of God, remember what Paul tell us, that is to stand firm in obedience, to keep loving God and our neighbor, help each other, to agree in the Lord and see everything from the perspective of eternity, that we will be in the same fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ in the new heaven and new earth. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have done with our study from your word. We pray that you will bless all of us with the right understanding of this truth and help us to, to do whatever you want us to do, to stand firm, to stand firm in obedience to you, that to love you and to love our neighbor. Help us be a faithful Christian, especially in this kind of situation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.
Now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give us shalom.